particularly Dr. Wani, who is a consultant microbiologist at uh, Metro, RV Metro here in Bangalore, and Mr. Vasan Madhav, uh, a senior advocate at Karnataka High Court, will be joining us in another five, 10 minutes. I thank all the sponsors uh, who had stood with my center uh, throughout this year, and particularly uh, uh, Mr. Javed from Intas. I thank uh, Dr. Ashok Sham uh, uh, from Ortho TV, who's been an inspirational person uh, for our orthopedic community uh, throughout the last one year of uh, COVID lockdowns and even before. And uh, last but not the least, I thank all the delegates who are joining uh, through Ortho TV and uh, other portals for this uh, unique uh, thought-provoking webinar. So here we have got uh, three faculties, Dr. Wani, uh, who is a consultant microbiologist at uh, Metro, RV Metro, Mr. Vasan Madhav, who is an advocate at the Karnataka High Court and uh, uh, Sessions Court here, and myself. The program details is like this. Uh, we start off, uh, you know, uh, celebrating International Women's Day. I'm going to have a brief video presentation on uh, osteoporosis. And uh, then we will move on to, uh, you know, about the COVID-19 and uh, the vaccination and some of the controversies and uh, where we are, you know, as of yesterday regarding the vaccination. So I'll talk about that. Uh, this will be followed by a very unique uh, talk on a concept called COI product. And uh, Dr. Wani is going to uh, tell us a very scientific way of dealing with the corona pandemic in India. And, uh, you know, what's probably is the right way, uh, you know, in terms of a personalized medicine, how do we go about uh, vaccinating ourselves as doctors and our patients as well? And last but not the least, we'll keep the best for the last. Uh, you know, this is the part two of Judiciary in the Hot Seat. Mr. Vasan Madhav is not new to this program, and uh, he is an expert on consumer protection law and uh, also on the, uh, you know, the land issues, land laws, that is his expertise. So we are going to look at the legal issues surrounding the COVID vaccination and, uh, and beyond, actually. We'll look at how to protect the patient and the doctor, and uh, we'll discuss some of the legal controversies uh, in the present-day India, and they should really uh, make the whole program very spicy, actually. So uh, then we'll close by around 8 o'clock. So uh, uh, I would like to introduce and uh, acknowledge uh, you know, Dr. Wani, uh, who I actually did her uh, MD uh, microbiology from the uh, Kim's College uh, here near my uh, uh, alma mater, which is Bangalore Medical College. And uh, she was a SR at uh, St. John's uh, Hospital, which is a reputed hospital in Bangalore. Now she is in charge of molecular biology and serology uh, at uh, RV Metro Hospital, Bangalore. And Mr. Mr. Vasan Madhav will be joining uh, soon. Uh, he is a senior advocate in Karnataka High Court and uh, specialist in consumer protection laws. And also his expertise is in uh, land laws. And uh, we just uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Ashok and Mr. Javed as well. Uh, coming to, uh, you know, management of common orthopedic condition, particularly osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis is called as a, a silent killer. And uh, for those who don't me, I'm Dr. Srikant Kain. I'm uh, uh, a proprietor and managing director for Southeast Priority Knee and Hip Center and also consultant cohort of corporate hospitals in South Bangalore. I trained in UK in all aspects of orthopedics and trauma. I have specialist interest in uh, computer-assisted and robotic uh, knee hip surgery. I did a general medical council recognized fellowship at Plymouth Teaching Hospital in the UK. I also have a passion for hip and knee revision surgery. Uh, I worked in Avon Orthopedic Center for that. And a uh, great passion for uh, uh, infected revision surgery. So uh, I worked in endoclinic in Germany with Prof. Gurkha, who is one of the world-renowned authorities on infected revision. Uh, this is a presentation of fellowship by Dr. Jonathan Keenan, the Director of Orthoplasty at Plymouth Teaching Hospitals. Uh, this is my second fellowship with uh, Dr. Ebert Smith, the UK Head of European Hip Society. Dr. Ebert is not a stranger to the India. He was here in Bangalore two to three years ago, where we had a fantastic program. And, uh, you know, I and Ebert uh, did the first spare approach for HIP in the uh, Holiday Institute of Medical Science in New Delhi. Uh, this is with uh, Prof. Garka, one of my uh, um, uh, teachers. And uh, he doesn't need any introduction because he's the guru for single stage uh, septic revision surgery in the world, along with Prof. Javed Parvezi. Coming to today's uh, topic, osteoporosis. Uh, center celebration of the World uh, uh, International Women's Day. So this is basically uh, a porous, uh, osteoporosis is a porous bone. It's a devastating disease that robs its uh, victims of the bone mass. It's also called as a silent killer. Uh, you know, for those who are non-doctors joining the uh, webinar, on the left-hand side, you have a normal bone, which has got uh, basically the white thing is the bone and the black thing is uh, uh, the spaces. 
uh, or the pores. On the right side, the black uh, pores increase and hence uh, the bone becomes osteoporotic. And these bones are quite brittle. And if there is a fall from a standing height, then there's a chance of uh, sustaining a wrist fracture or a spine fracture or fracture of the hip, which are three more uh, most dev devastating fractures in osteoporosis. The number of myths uh, about osteoporosis, and uh, one of the myths is that uh, why should I worry I'm uh, you know uh, uh, too young or too old uh, to get osteoporosis. But uh, osteoporosis is a progressive disease and uh, it irreversibly weakens bone. Any movement or bump can cause debilitating fracture. Chronic pain and disability are the potential outcomes of uh, uh, this uh, condition. Hip fracture can cause death in uh, around a third of patients in the first one year. The second myth is that I'm a healthy person, I do the right thing, so why should I be bothered? But osteoporosis is a silent uh, thief, uh, as I mentioned, a silent killer. And you can't feel how strong your bones are. And this is very, very important. We can feel how strong our muscles are, but not how strong our bones are. In addition, one of our, one of uh, two women and one out of five men have a lifetime risk of getting osteoporosis. The other myth is that I'm too young to worry about it now. <clears throat> it is never too early to prevent osteoporosis. Osteoporosis can strike at any age. Bone is a living, growing tissue that constantly rebuilds. Then the last myth is that it's too late for me to do anything about osteoporosis. But to the contrary, the bone loss, although may be irreversible, but you can slow or stop its further progress. The time to do something is now before you have experienced so much bone loss that you are at high risk for the fracture. This is a worldwide uh, incidence. And if you look at the incidence of the spine fracture from osteoporosis, uh, it's around 700,000 uh, in the US per year. And wrist fracture is around 200,000 uh, per year in the US. And hip fracture is around 200,000 uh, uh, per year. The burden of disease, one out of four osteoporotic hip fractures resulting in long-term long nursing home care. One half of these are unable to walk without assistance. Around 30% uh, have greater risk of dying within one year following the fracture. We look at the spine on the left side, it is a straight spine, but on the right side, because of multiple wedge compression fractures of the spine, one has developed a deformity, which is forward bending of the spine called kyphosis. <clears throat> Symptoms and warning signs, persistent unexplained back pain, shorter than you used to be, spinal deformities, recurrent fractures, Fractures from minimal trauma, I said, you know, uh, typically osteoporosis is defined uh, for fractures defined as fall from the standing height. In a normal individual, one should not develop fracture if you fall from a standing height. And experiencing chronic medical problems. What are the risk factors to get osteoporosis? One is being female, thin or small frame, low body weight, smoker, alcoholic, advanced stage, history of fragility fracture, and particularly family history of primary relative having a osteoporosis or a osteoporotic fragility fracture. Other risk factors are postmenopausal. Hormonal imbalances can result in rapid bone loss. We know between the age of 45 and 65, women lose twice the bone mass compared to men. And uh, women can lose up to 20% of their bone mass in five to seven years' time. What about men and osteoporosis? Around 5 million Americans are at risk of osteoporosis. One third of the male hip fractures are related to osteoporosis. One third of these men will not survive at the end of one year following the fracture of the hip. A bone densitometry is the gold standard to diagnose osteoporosis. Who should get bone densitometry? Anybody with a fragility fracture, all women aged 65 and older, postmenopausal, younger than 65 years old, with risk factors should get a BMD scan. Men over 50 with risk factors should get BMD scan. Treatment. The mainstay of treatment is supplementation with calcium and vitamin D. Bisphosphonates are uh, drugs which basically inhibit the osteoclast, which is a bone-eating uh, cell, and they are quite widely in use. Estrogen replacement therapy was in use, uh, but because of risk of uh, cancers, you know, its uh, use is uh, quite limited. Uh, the mainstay of treatment is, uh, of course, anabolics, or uh, what is called as a teriparatide, which is uh, a, a drug which uh, stimulates osteoblast, which is a bone-forming cell. Terifrank is one of the brands. And this has been a game changer in the last uh, decade and a half uh, as far as osteoporosis treatment is concerned. The newer anti-catabolics have come like denosumab, uh, you know, which is basically inhibitor of the osteoclast again. And the advantage with this is it can be given once in six months as the injection. Other primordial prevention is through diet. You know, what are the diets which are rich in calcium and vitamin D? 
like green leafy vegetables milk orange uh, fishes like sardine and beans etc again rich source of vitamin d sunlight very important and then again milk and cheese paneer and fishes weight bearing exercise is very important but if you have a very uh, fragile bone uh, then you need to consult your doctor before you start this weight bearing exercises one of the most important thing in osteoporosis is falls prevention and exercises like tai chi or uh, greatly help reduce falls and uh, those who have got increased risk of hip fracture with uh, osteoporosis you know protective uh, wearing hip uh, uh, protector is very very useful and uh, it's been evidence that it reduces hip fracture so i really thank you very much for your patient listening uh, you know these are my details to contact and i will uh, sort of uh, move on uh, next to the next presentation which is about uh, covid uh, uh, and vaccination and then that will be followed by presentation from dr wani about uh, you know an amazing concept uh, which probably each one us have to follow thank you Dr. Wani, the voice was clear, right? Yes, sir. It was clear. Okay, okay great. I'll try to get my second presentation on board, and then uh, you can set your presentation up. Dr. Ashok, uh, it is saying I can't minimize the Zoom when I'm recording the meeting, so I'm not able to access my uh, I'm not able to access my desktop actually. <laughs> I'll just allow Mr. Vasan Madhav has joined in. It will get recorded, is it? Okay. Uh, I'm not able to minimize and uh, see my desktop. So one second. Yeah. Uh, can you see my desktop from there, uh, Ashok, or is that not possible? Okay, yeah. So because it says I need to minimize to get to my desktop, and it says you can't minimize because. uh you are recording this meeting so i want my cat sorry i am on mac the site here i can access uh
Okay, great. So that's great. So I managed to get back on the track now. Mr. Mother, sir, good evening. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Wani here, who's a microbiology consultant uh, from uh, RV Metro. And we got uh, Dr. Ashok Sham from uh, Pune, who uh, is from Sanchati Hospital. And he's the head of the Ortho TV. And they are broadcasting this program uh, throughout India. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the plan is we have done one presentation. I will start my next uh, presentation on COVID-19 basics. And then Dr. Wani is going to introduce this COVID protect. And then we'll come back to the medical legal uh, aspects. I've told everybody that uh, we are saving the best for the last. Right. I'm here. Okay, sir. Thank you. Right. Uh, Dr. Ashok, I'll start on. So I think I managed to find the presentation. So... Uh, Uh, good evening again, uh, doctors and friends. Uh, I'll talk now about uh, COVID-19 basics and vaccination. And this will be followed by a related topic uh, on uh, COVID protect by Dr. Wani, uh, who is an expert uh, in this field, actually. Uh, again, for those who do not know me, I'm uh, Dr. Srikant Kayan, consultant dean hip surgeon. Uh, these are my qualifications. And uh, I was, I'm a present uh, proprietor in MDF uh, Southeast Priority Orthopedic Center and also cover court of corporate hospitals in South Bangalore. So I again, take this opportunity to thank uh, Mr. Hassan Madhav and Dr. Wani and uh, Dr. Ashok Sham and Javed Sharif uh, for the help with this program. And uh, yeah, let's look at uh, COVID-19 pandemic. You know, uh, the world is going through and uh, probably gone through a very unprecedented times. We are sort of lucky or unlucky to be witnessing and going through a once in a hundred year pandemic after the great Spanish flu. A glass of water is either half empty or half full. It depends on our attitude. What I feel is that the virus need not stop our way of living if we understand the rules of the game and abide by nature. How to be optimist in a pessimistic world? You know, this, as I said, is a once in a lifetime event. Around 50% of the world population was under some kind of lockdown, and this number might decrease or increase depending on uh, which stage of the pandemic we are in. The millions of patients with chronic conditions and non-serious conditions are being affected by the lockdown. We still keep learning new things about this virus. Every day, new facets of the virus come into uh, you know, our purview, purview. And also about vaccination, new facets about vaccination also come into our purview. This is a thing which somebody sent, you know, is this a natural disaster or a man-made disaster? And uh, I think the jury is still not out. I think a team from WHO went to Wuhan, uh, but they sort of written uh, with empty hands, you know, that uh, makes one wonder if it's still a man-made uh, disaster. And there's a beautiful uh, quote somebody sent me recently uh, about uh, us as human beings on earth, you know, how we will point uh, at the polluted oceans, the dried up rivers, the melted ice caps, and say to our metaphorical children, one day all this will be yours. Oh, sorry about what we did with it. You know, I think they may be a little angry at us. History may indeed write us off as a termite people or somebody who sort of uh, eats, eats up, you know, what we sort of live in, our beloved Mother Earth. We have destroyed, polluted and slaughtered and made a pretty poor show of things. Individually, we can make a difference. We must make a difference. Individually, history must hold us accountable. The trouble is there are so many people who won't change because they think they won't be held accountable. If there is one, if there is no one watching, they think they can get away with murder. History will make short work of them. So very, very interesting read. So history may indeed remember, indeed write us, you know, the present generation of human beings living on earth as a termite people. So why this pandemic? You know, I've sort of given a metaphysical reason why the pandemic. Well, let's look at the medical reason why the pandemic. Why this pandemic is happening is because uh, we got a new virus in a non-immune world, as simple as that. We need around 70 to 80% of the population to either get infected or to get vaccinated to develop herd immunity. And that's, that's how the pandemic will stop and die down. Uh, we know that if somebody is more than 60 years old, they are, you know, if, if they have any comorbidities, they're uh, at an increased risk of mortality. But I would say that anyone is at an increased risk of mortality, irrespective of the age, provided one is exposed to sufficient viral load. And, uh, you know, many young children have been affected, so middle-aged uh, people are also being affected. 
uh, the newborns are being uh, affected through placental transmission. And we recently had a paper a couple of days ago which said that, uh, you know, a mother getting a COVID vaccination in the third month of trimester, third trimester of pregnancy managed to transmit antibodies to the uh, unborn baby. So the healthcare workers and the frontline workers are exposed to dangers like never before. And we know now know in India that uh, we are starting second wave and, you know, it will be creating more sort of drama for all the healthcare workers. Some basics, what is SARS-CoV-2? It's a RNA virus and causing acute severe uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And, uh, you know, this transmission is through person-to-person, uh, -person, through either droplet, aerosol, or through contact called fomites or other possible routes like a fecal route. Incubation period is typically between 2 to 14 days, but one can be infective uh, during the most symptomatic phase and also in the pre-symptomatic phase as well. So what are the common uh, symptoms? You heard ad nauseum about this in all the televisions and mobiles, fever, cough, shortness of breath. I'll not go into details of this. So more importantly, how does our body fight back? You know, how is the fight happening? This is the most important question. And this happens via immunity. And this is what we are here to discuss today. Immune system, what is this? It consists of cells, tissues, molecules that mediate resistance to infection. What is immunology? A study of structure and function of the immune system. What is immunity? It is resistance of a host to pathogens and their toxic effects. What is the immune response? It's a collective and coordinated response to the introduction of a foreign substance in the individual mediated by the cells and molecules of the immune system. Some of this can be basics for doctors, but you know, they're non-medical friends joining, so kindly bear with that. So what is the role of our immune system? It causes, a, it's a defense against microbes. It also defends against the cancer cells. It also helps in the homeostasis. So what are the immune systems, you know, how they are organized? They are, you know, sort of divided into organs and uh, the immune organs in the body are tonsils and adenoids, which are present in our throat, thymus, which is pre predominantly present in children, you know, just behind the breastbone or sternum, and it sort of disappears by around, around uh, adolescent age. Lymph nodes, which you find in the groin and axilla, which swell up during infection. Spleen, which is a very large organ, uh, which also a defense, uh, you know, organ for the body. Pace patches are patches along the intestine, which has got uh, lymphoid tissue, appendix, lymphatic vessels, and bone marrow. The second part of the immune system consists of cells, and these are lymphocytes or white blood cells. Basically, there are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and plasma cells and natural killer cells. And there are big cells called as the macrophages or monocytes, which are huge and which can gulp a lot of bacteria and viruses. Then there are cells called granulocytes because you can stain them either into pink by eosinophils or basophils, which are blue, and neutrophils, and they are also part of the white blood cells. The third is the molecule, which is a part of the uh, robust uh, immune system. So what are these molecules? The basic uh, you know, ingredients are antibodies. Second is a system called complement system. Third is cytokines. All of you would be familiar now with the term cytokine storm, where for COVID, the cytokines release are too much, you know, exaggerated, which in fact damages body rather than helps. Then there are interleukins and interferons. Coming to the two types of immunity, you have an innate immunity or a non-adaptive immunity, which is the first line of immune response. So these are cells present in the respiratory tract or in the intestinal tract, which can really attack the foreign organism like a virus or a bacteria, you know, without any memory. So the second type is acquired or adaptive immunity, where when the innate immunity fails or the virus manages to breach the first defense, in the body, this second line of response becomes, um, you know, important. And uh, this response relies on the mechanism that adapt after infection. It's handled by the white cell, white cells, basically T and B lymphocytes. And one cell determines one antigenic determinant. So if there is a, a single protein, a clone of cells is produced to attack the single protein. So, uh, you know, the this immunity is based on the genetic makeup. It relies on already formed components. And a rapid response occurs within minutes of infection this is the innate immunity. And it's very nonspecific. You know, same molecule cells respond to a range of pathogens. It has no memory, same response after repeated exposure and does not lead to uh, memory or a clonal expansion like acquired immunity. 
second line of defense based on resistance acquired during life relies on genetic events and cellular growth responds most slowly over a few days is specific like each cell responds to a single epitope on an antigen you know and has a, what is called as a memory anamnestic memory so the second exposure repeat exposure leads to faster stronger and a bigger response and it also leads to clonal expansion of a particular cell type which can attack a particular antigen so there are many types of uh, this uh, secondary immunity natural artificial active immunity and passive immunity passive immunity comes from placenta and breast milk but active immunity actually comes from the actual infection but artificial active immunity can come from vaccination the subject matter of today's discussion the vaccination can be live vaccine like you know polio or it could be you know killed purified antigen vaccine and last but not the least is immune serum and the immune cells can also help in uh, defense uh, against the organisms let's look at the adaptive mechanisms you know it's a cell mediated immune response t lymphocytes you know they eliminate intracellular microbes that survive within the phag within and phagocytize them uh, and uh, the humoral immune response which basically is done by the b lymphocytes is mediated by the antibodies and they eliminate extracellular microbes and their toxins so this is a picture showing what exactly how this humoral response occurs the b lymphocyte uh, gets attached to the antigens or the virus and they proliferate differentiating the antibody secreting plasma cells antibodies bind to the specific antigen and the microbes destroy microbes via a specific mechanism some b lymphocytes evolve into resting cells or memory cells which can be used for the second attack when the body faces the same virus you know a few months or few years later so let's look at the antibodies or immunoglobulins these are basically a gamma globulin fraction of the serum protein it's a type of protein it's y or t shaped polypeptide uh, means it's a protein it has got two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains all immunoglobulins are not antibodies there are basically five kinds of antibodies igg igm quite important iga very important in uh, you know the primary immunity in the respiratory and the intestinal epithelium igd the role is not very clear ige is involved in atopy or anaphylaxis where uh, people with allergy like asthma hyper respond uh, you know to the antigen coming to igg this is the main you know it's around 70 to 85 75% of the total immunoglobulin is secreted in high quantities in secondary exposures it crosses the placenta its major function is neutralize microbes and toxins opsonize antigens for phagocytosis activate the complement system and protect the newborn a fourfold rise or fall indicates an active infection a single positive sample indicates the past exposure coming to igm secreted uh, initially during a primary infection it cannot cross the placenta it is quite big its uh, major function application is secreted first during the primary exposure it activates the complement it's used as a marker of recent infection so if there is igm in the blood it indicates that the presence uh, in uh, newborn means infection single positive sample in serum or csf indicate a recent infection so basically a marker for early phase of infection so uh, you know the rest of the thing you know ige and uh, ige uh, a are important igd we don't know the functions of that yet and ige is important because it's involved in uh, hypersensitivity reactions like atopy or asthma it's also monomeric and it's uh, you know associated with anaphylaxis plays a role in immunity to helminthic or parasitic infection so the sequence of activation first igm gets activated then uh, igg gets activated i think dr wani is going to deal with it uh, in detail so i'll not go further this is the important slide which looks at the first stimulus and how the igm forms first and then the igg antibodies form it's very important to see why we need the second dose of vaccination because the second stimulus is the one which gives to a massive response or an anamnestic response so hence we need two doses coming to failure of the immune response the immune response can sometimes fail you know to defend against microbes or some cancers and this can happen because of hypersensitivity or immunodeficiency and one of the kind of hypersensitivity is probably seen in the covid uh, in the cytokine storm phase where it's not actually the virus which is causing the damage but our own immune system is overreacting and drowning our own body in our own uh, defense materials and uh, thus causing damage to the multiple organs in the human system so this is what is called as allergy or hypersensitivity or autoimmunity so 
summary primary immune response short lasting smaller in magnitude secondary immune response longer in duration larger in magnitude there is a, a possibility of development of memory cells so that it remembers the same virus when it attacks them at a future time failure of the immune response can result in hypersensitivity which can lead to death or uh, can lead to immunodeficiency coming to uh, the what we are going through the covid-19 vaccination where we are you know as of uh, today uh, the approved vaccines in india as you know are covaxin from bharat biotech and covishield from serum institute of india also called as a oxford astrazeneca vaccine the other vaccines which have got fda approval like uh, pfizer vaccine and moderna but uh, they are very temperature sensitive and uh, they can't be used in india at present because we don't have uh, deep freeze facilities Uh, all over the country efficacy of these vaccines in prevention of serious infection or death is close to 100% that means once the vaccine is taken the chance of the person dying or getting serious covid infection is close to zero efficacy of the vaccine in preventing symptomatic covid infection is between 60 to 95% that means 5 to 40% of the patients will still get a covid infection even after the second dose of the vaccination poor efficacy is in asymptomatic covid infection that means the vaccines you know really don't prevent asymptomatic infection that means one can have both the doses of vaccination and yet one can be infected asymptomatically and can spread the virus to other people like super spreaders nasal vaccine is on the way like from zydus cadil and covaxin and if this comes you know it is it prevents asymptomatic infection because the virus is attacked in the nasal mucosa where the ig you know a antibodies are formed which will stop even the first attack of the viral infection but this is still being developed vaccination of pregnant women leads to fetal protection from the recent data which came out two days ago vaccination what is the biggest contraindication for this vaccination you know our people with severe anaphylaxis to covid or non covid vaccines if we had a vaccine you know for covid or covid type illnesses in the past and if you develop severe reaction to the vaccine please do not take the vaccine because it is contraindicated but if you have just a food allergy or a latex allergy or asthma you can take the vaccine if you had a previous covid infection or if you are admitted and had a plasma therapy for covid where you are infused with antibodies you know you need to give a gap of at least 6 to 8 weeks you know for to take the vaccination those who are suffering from diabetes mellitus can take it and those who are on steroids you you know they are on very high dose steroids for rheumatoid arthritis or sandhivayu you need to allow the steroid dose to be less than 7.5 mg per day for at least 6 weeks before vaccination is given so that immune response is effective those who are on anti cancer drugs or anti rheumatic drugs like methotrexate you know you need to give a gap of 2 weeks before and 2 weeks after the vaccination you know the drug should be stopped and started 2 weeks after vaccination suppose you want to undergo surgery and you had vaccination you need to wait 2 weeks after vaccination to undergo any surgery if you need a bone marrow transplant for cancers like blood cancer you need to wait 3 months you know till absolute neutrophil count comes to normal and older people you know should take the vaccine because the benefit from the vaccine for the older people above 60 you know outweigh the risk you know from the vaccination hence they should take it if somebody has got dementia or neurological disease they can't make a decision for themselves you know covid appropriate behavior is not possible they should be given vaccination if somebody has got a kidney failure cardiac failure liver failure or autoimmune disease like so jogren's uh, syndrome you can take it but the immune response from the vaccine may be poor if you are on aspirin blood thinners like aspirin or travix which is clopidogrel you can still take the vaccination there's no contraindication and uh, yeah so let's look at some of the controversies we are looking you know from the vaccination point of view you know death due to vaccination you know the direct causal relationship between vaccine and death has not been established throughout the world as of now uh some politicians said that after taking vaccination you get impotency due to vaccination uh you know the contrary is true actually uh suppose somebody doesn't take vaccine they get covid now it is well known that the covid cause inflammatory reaction of the testis and epididymis what is called as epididyma arcatis and can destroy you know the testis and that can lead to definite impotency not taking vaccine but not uh, not, not taking the vaccine actually leading to covid can cause you know impotency 
So increased clotting, this has been quite controversial. And I think yesterday the European Medical Council cleared the Oxford AstraZeneca and they said that the risk of clotting is less. As Indians, I think uh, we are genetically predisposed to less clotting compared to Caucasians, where, you know, it was my common practice to use anticoagulants after the routine surgery. And we don't know what the patient is reacting to. Is it to the vaccine uh, viral component or is it to the diluents, you know, the, what is made up of, uh, you know, uh, the vaccine, other constituents of the vaccine. So eventually, I think even the kids should get vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. So... Uh, I think uh, there should be a rational and scientific basis of having vaccination. And, you know, this uh, scientific basis, I followed myself, actually. So you need to, ideally, you need to check your own antibody titer and uh, look at uh, what is your antibody titer. And, uh, you know, depending on that, you can take the correct dose of the vaccine. You know, Oxford AstraZeneca had trials where they had a full dose and they had a half dose. You know, many patients reacted adversely to the full dose. And hence, even the trial half dose was given and they had least side effects. And in fact, they found that the immunity response with the half dose and then the full dose later on was 90% protective compared to two full doses, which are only 70% protective. So you recheck the titer after the first dose of vaccination and you have to have the correct interval for the second dose. And then recheck the neutralizing antibody titer of the second dose. And, uh, you know, this is the way, you know, scientific way of going about uh, a proper vaccination. I know in a mass pandemic, it may be challenging, but this forms a component of the individualized medicine or personalized medicine. And Dr. Wani is going to deal with it a bit more in detail, really, and enlighten us. So I thank you very much for, uh, you know, your patient listening. And there is a saying uh, in, uh, I'm a joint replacement uh, robotic surgeon. And there's a basic saying uh, in our joint replacement surgery, orthoplasty, that if you fail to prepare, you're prepared to fail. So I think with the second wave setting in, in India, I think it's uh, ever so relevant. And we need to prepare for this uh, deadly disease and fight it uh, tooth and nail. Thank you. I'll just, uh, you know, stop sharing my presentation and uh, let... Uh, uh, Dr. Wani, whom I've already introduced, um, share her slides actually. So, uh, uh, Dr. Wani, can you hear me? And uh, is it possible for you to share your presentation, please? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. You can see. So, I just have to go to the a slide, I think. The last slide is similar. Okay. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, how we protect. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shrikan. Thank you for introducing me and thank you for the beautiful presentation which you gave. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about COVID uh, protect uh, today. So, what's the million dollar question nowadays? Okay. So, I think you will all be seeing the news. I'm not talking about uh, the controversy that's happening in Mumbai or the controversy that's happening in Bangalore. Did he do it or did he not? The million dollar, dollar question for me as of now is, am I safe? Are we all safe? Okay. So what does it mean? Now we know that we are in the second phase of vaccination for COVID. And uh, after all the health workers, now it's the turn of our elderly to get vaccinated. So after we have all got vaccinated uh, and our elderly have started getting vaccinated, the main question is after taking vaccination, am I safe? So now how do we know am I safe? Are we safe? Yes. Or oh, you must be thinking, oh, come on, we know we are safe because we have antibodies. But how do we know that you have antibodies? What are the antibodies to be tested for? This is what I'm going to uh, tell you in the next few slides. Okay. Now, first is why do we need to look for antibodies? And studies, several studies have shown that presence of anti-SARS-CoV antibodies is, uh, if it is already there in a person, he is less likely to have a subsequent infection. Okay, So there will not be any reinfection in the person. This is for the person who is vaccinated. Now, what about the community? There are cohort studies which have said or which have shown that if there are, these, there are people among antibody positive persons, there is an 80 to 90 percent reduction in the incidence of infection among such people. OK, so presence of anti sars covid antibodies not only protects you, but it also helps in herd immunity. OK, so it is very, very important that, you know, you have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 after vaccination. Then the other thing is presence of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 
indicates or uh, uh, it correlates with the decrease in the viral load in the respiratory tract. The more the number of antibodies you have against SARS-CoV-2, the less the viral load will be in your respiratory tract. So even there are a lot of variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses, okay, and some of them are known to cause uh, reinfection. So if you have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, and if you do get infected even after vaccination, there is a likely chance that the severity will be very, very less because of the decreased viral load, because of your good immune response. And several studies have shown, especially in animals, uh, especially monkeys. Okay. So, all are all antibodies the same? Can I go to a lab and say, just test COVID antibodies? Is it enough? I would like to say no. We need to look at different things. One is the quality of the antibodies. What kind of antibodies these are? Whether these are just blocking antibodies or these are neutralizing antibodies. And we need to know what is the quantity, how, how much is there actually. And we need to know how long these last. These are the questions that we need to ask before we actually get tested for the antibodies. Okay, so just before I go to the type of antibodies and the protection, a little bit of the SARS-CoV-2, not great because we all, uh, what we actually know a lot about the structure. The important thing I would like to say here is, once again, I just like to use a pointer here. Okay, there are a lot of uh, antigens on the surface of the virus. Okay, you have the envelope protein, you have the membrane protein, spike protein, nucleocapsid protein. Of these, the nucleocapsid protein uh, produces antibodies and the spike uh, protein uh, will result in production of antibodies. So two important antigen targets, one is the spike protein and the other is the nucleocapsid protein. So both of them, uh, you can find antibodies in a person who has been infected. Okay. Out of this, the spike protein is a very, very important protein. This is the one that actually binds to the host cell, that is the AC2 receptors, okay? So, we all know SARS-CoV-2 binds to the AC2 receptors on the host cell and then enters into the body. So, the spike protein is the most important antigen and hence it gives rise to the most important antibodies. So, if there are antibodies against the spike protein, there will not be any attachment of the virus to the host cell. So, please remember that. The spike protein basically prevents the entry of the virus into the host. So, this is the spike protein, okay? The spike protein, it has two regions, the S1 and S2. It binds to the AC2, or the uh, uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptors. And this uh, S1 portion has a receptor binding domain, which actually binds to the uh, uh, ACE2 receptors. So this uh, uh, spike proteins are the common target for vaccine as well as they are the therapeutic focus, okay? Because if we develop antibodies or any, uh, what you can say, uh, therapeutics, it basically targets, uh, uh, what you can say, it does not allow the virus itself to enter. That is why we are basically focusing on spike uh, antibodies. These spike antibodies are, in other terms, they are called as neutralizing antibodies. Okay. So, coming to the uh, course of the antibodies or the immune response in uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2, here you can see, okay, after you have been infected, it takes around one week for the antibodies to develop. You have both the IgG antibodies and the IgM antibodies developing simultaneously or the IgM antibodies will be one to two days ahead of the IgG. This is different to other infections where you see the IgM for around two to three months and then the IgG develops. But here in SARS-CoV-2, the IgM and IgG are detected almost simultaneously. That is why in SARS-CoV-2, we don't usually ask for differentiation between IgM and IgG. IgG detection is good enough and it lasts for more than usually IgM will disappear by six weeks and IgG will last for more than six weeks up to three months to six months. As of now, they have detected IgG antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 for up to six months. Okay. So, already told you, what do we know? Uh, this is not required. Okay. So, again, back to the question, are all antibody tests the same? No, of course. We have two type of antibodies. One is the binding antibody detection. These antibodies, they just bind to the virus. They do not 
inhibit the virus they are just binding antibodies okay they do not help in any way okay and that and you have the neutralizing antibody which actually neutralizes the virus and prevents the development of infection okay so in sars cov2 there are two types of antibodies which we detect one is a nucleocapsid antibody and the other is the neutralizing antibody that is the spike protein okay so binding antibodies are the nucleocapsid antibodies and neutralizing antibodies are the spike proteins so we are mainly concerned about neutralizing antibodies or the spike antibodies because they are the ones that help in protection or they are the ones that gives us immunity okay so all these days before vaccination uh, came up in india we used to detect antibodies against nucleocapsid why nucleocapsid was targeted previously was this nucleocapsid is a very well uh, what you can say conserved antigen and even if there is uh, what you can say there is no lot of mutation in the nucleocapsid protein hence they were able to detect all antibodies so even in the variants if you want to detect any past infection the nucleocapsid will give you an idea whether previously he has been infected or not that is why all these days we were doing the nucleocapsid antibody detection but now since after immunization we are mainly focusing protection and hence we are looking for neutralizing antibodies that is the spike proteins so what's the difference between nucleocapsid antibodies and spike antibodies as i already told you the spike antibodies are protective in nature so you would want to look for these protective antibodies especially after infection or even after vaccination okay then infection uh nucleocapsid antibodies as well as spike antibodies both are positive after infection both can be used for diagnosis but following vaccination only antibodies against spike protein will be eliminated your nucleocapsid antibodies will be nil so please remember that so if a person has been vaccinated and you're looking for antibodies you will find only spike antibodies uh, will be eliminated that is because a covid shield targets only the it has the spike antigen and hence will give rise or it will help in developing only the spike antibodies okay and if you want to know a person's antibody levels for plasma exchange therapy again you will have to do only spike antibodies and for zero prevalence you can do both nucleocapsid as well as spike antibody detection Uh, uh i told you in the previous slide again these antibodies can be used for zero zero surveillance as well as use uh, we can uh, identify potential donors for uh, in case of plasma therapy okay so coming to what we have introduced in um, metropolis here in metropolis healthcare rv metropolis we have launched the immunity check test called the covid protect okay so this is a quantitative blood test which measures the immune status of an individual after vaccination or after an infection okay so you can detect uh, the presence of protective antibodies or neutralizing antibodies which we call in a person after vaccination or after infection and it is quantitative in nature it gives your quantitative value okay so why covid protect is ideal first is it is a it determines antibodies against the spike proteins which are protective in nature it is a truly quantitative test the other tests which are actually available in other labs are semi quantitative in nature but covid protect is a quantitative test and it has an excellent traceability to who standards okay so this is w this these terms are actually uh, terms which we use in the lab that means that it uh, what you can say uh, Uh, complies with the who standards and it has good concordance with the neutralizing antibodies in other terms it detects the neutralizing antibodies so when is the ideal time to do a covid protect test this can be done either when you have a natural infection after 15 days or best would be 3 to 4 weeks after natural infection or after 2 weeks after the second dose of the vaccine okay so the ideal time would be after vaccination after 2 weeks after the second dose of vaccination you can also do it after natural infection to see if you have been protected 
okay so some patients may actually ask even after the first dose you would they would want to do but yes you can also do it after the first dose if you want but the chances that the tighter will be less is uh, it, the chances will be higher that they are tighter will be low after the first dose so it is ideal they do it after the second dose two weeks after the second dose okay so this test actually takes a very little time it takes about 18 minutes for us to run but since we do batch testing we will take we have a tag of around 24 hours so if you give the test today you will receive the report tomorrow testing principle is based on chemiluminescence this is a highly sensitive method and uh, uh, linear range that is it can detect as less as 0.4 uh, units per ml to as much as 250 units per ml okay so how do we interpret it uh, around point uh, if it is less than 0.8 units per ml it is considered non non reactive if it is more than 0.8 unit per ml it is considered as reactive okay so that is how we interpret it and the specimens can be serum okay serum would be the ideal sample you can also send lithium heparin or uh, sodium citrate plasma but uh, better to send serum sample so what is the sample volume around 20 microliter is sufficient to run this test and it has a great sensitivity and specificity of more than 98 to 99% okay. so the cost of this test is rupees 850 and the report will be available the next working day so coming to the interpretation now you have got the report of presence or absence of antibodies so how do we actually interpret it so if a person has never been vaccinated and he has antibodies against nucleocapsid or the spike or the receptor binding domain it indicates that the person has had previous infection natural infection in a vaccinated person if you are i'm talking about covid shield if the person has been vaccinated with covid shield he will have antibodies against the s protein and negative against other antigen like the nucleocapsid so and you will also get the titer and so you will know whether he is protected or not in case a person has got a covaxin uh, vaccine okay this covaxin is a whole cell vaccine so this person will have antibodies against n and s proteins okay so please remember if the person has taken vaccine against covid shield the spike antibodies will be elevated if the person has taken covaxin he will have antibodies against nucleocapsid as well as the spike protein okay there are still some unanswered questions following vaccination following uh, protective antibodies that is one is what is the actual protective level of antibodies so here uh, if you can uh, remember or you can correlate we have the hepatitis b vaccine we know that more than 10 milli international units per ml indicates protection but as of now we don't have studies which actually tell us what levels are actually protective against covid or sars cov 2 so that is one unanswered question the other unanswered question is how long does uh, these vaccine will protect us so, or how long with the immunity last even with natural infection we are not sure with covid how long does there how long will the protection be and it's the same with the vaccine we do not know how long will they protect but as of now they have detected antibodies for up to 6 months in patients with natural infection and as also with vaccines so up to 6 month the person will definitely be protected and the other and we can also correlate this with the other sars viruses that is the sars cov1 and the res, uh, uh, middle eastern respiratory syndrome there they have measured up to 2 years they have measurable antibodies so we are hoping against this sars cov2 also the antibody levels will last for up to 2 years but as of now studies have shown that they will provide protection for up to 6 months thank you and uh, if you have any questions i would like to uh, answer uh, great madam uh, thank you for the fantastic uh, presentation so it was re really illuminating and uh, 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 yeah it is uh, if uh, i had a question madam so basically if uh, a plasma donor is a very common concept in the covid so if i have to be a plasma donor what would be the ideal levels of uh, you know antibodies that should be there in my body 
So usually for plasma pteresis, they expect more than 250 milli uh, more more than 250 units. Sir. Yeah, that is the levels. So that level could be easily measured, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes definitely. The Roche test, uh, what you were talking about, COVID Yes, product? yes, the Roche test, yes. And the pricing you said is around 800, 850, 850, 850, 850. Uh, per, per test. Okay, yes. that's great. Okay. Uh, any questions, uh, uh, Mr. Vasan? Do you have any questions or Dr. Ashok? Any questions? No, not in this aspect. Uh, not Dr. Sir was very, very uh, uh, to the point, and uh, he, has, uh, he was able to get so much of information out of this uh, talk by Dr. Vani. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I think, you know, we'll sort of move on to the next part of the presentation. And I said, uh, as they say, keeping the best for the last, uh, you know, this is where we'll get uh, uh, Mr. Vasan Madhav in. And uh, he has not been new to this. You know, in fact, we did the, you know, judiciary in the hot seat part one. Where we discussed about the new consumer protection law. Uh, this was, uh, I think, sometime in uh, last August we discussed. So it was quite popular as well. And now we, uh, the latest uh, hot uh, topic is vaccination. And uh, hence, we are going to uh, discuss about the legal aspects of uh, vaccination with uh, Mr. Vasan Madhav. And uh, we're going to use other uh, 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 pressing issues, uh, you know, in the country as well, as far as uh, uh, judiciary is concerned. And uh, to introduce again, uh, Mr. Vasan Madhav, he's an advocate in Karnataka High Court and Civil Court since 1988. And uh, he has got expertise in uh, consumer protection law and in the uh, you know judiciary in the hard seat part one. We discuss about the new consumer protection law, uh, how it applies to the doctors and other professions in the country. And Mr. Madhav also has got expertise in uh, real estate and uh, land acts. So uh, if there's any issues, uh, you know whom to contact. Uh, just a disclaimer, you know, all legal talks should come with disclaimer and they say call it as a fine print. So the intention of this topic is to provide information and hope for a better India for our future generation. The advice and contents can't be taken as gospel or extrapolated out of this context, uh, but uh, taken as individual opinion from a person with judicial knowledge. And no personal consultation is allowed in the Q&A se session. So only generic questions uh, can be asked uh, relating to judiciary. So uh, coming to this uh, statement from Martin Luther King, you all know him. Uh, he says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And uh, interestingly, not only was an activist and a civil rights leader, but he's also uh, was a, a man of church, he was a reverend. Uh, so we are all uh, now in the Epidemic Act uh, 1895. So Mike, uh, you know, this... Uh, Format will be a question and answer kind of uh, format with uh, Mr. Madhav. And I just want to ask him, uh, you know, what are the laws from the Epidemic Act, which is pertaining to every citizen uh, of this country in terms of their first duties, responsibilities, and then the rights? Mr. Madhav. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like uh, before, now Dr. Shrikant has given me certain questionnaires, uh, which may be also coming up on the screen. Now, before uh, uh, coming to the individual uh, uh, questions, I would like to bring or place the law which is as is available to the country. Now, there was an act called as the Epidemic Disease Act 1897, almost a century old. And uh, we are uh, like uh, Dr. Shrikan said, Dr. Vani said, there were so many issues that were in concern and uh, none of us uh, were even anticipating uh, that there would be something called as uh, dangerous epidemic uh, diseases uh, that may come up. Now, this Act of 1897 came with a large, uh, uh, huge change and there was an amendment uh, only in 2020 when this uh, COVID uh, came into play. Now, uh, like uh, most of these uh, questions which uh, Dr. Srikant has uh, raised, one of the like uh, the uh, Epidemic Act of 1897 consists only of about uh, four sections. Now, one of these uh, section, uh, uh, section four of the set 1897 Act, like most of the questions raised by Dr. Srikant or uh, in this um, talk, is uh, covered in 1987 itself. It uh, two line which reads like this protection to persons acting under act. No suit or other legal proceedings shall lie 
against any persons for anything done or in good faith intended to be done under this act now therefore most of these questions which uh, dr shrikant has raised vaccine taken by patient has serious adverse reaction like stroke uh, what is the recourse as is medicine there are no benefits without risk and a doctor organizes a vaccination in the hospital or clinic to help government agenda uh, how he has to protect himself all these things are covered in 1897 itself where the protection to persons if no suit or other legal proceeding shall lie against any person for anything done in good faith until unless the doctors the clinic the hospitals or whatever uh, place where this uh, vaccination is being done or treated treating the patients for uh, covid they are protected until unless it is contrarily proved that it was not done in good faith therefore that is impossible in our uh, judiciary setup therefore most of the questions raised by dr shrikant is answered now the other uh, amendment which came into force was in 2020 and all the lab uh, lucana which was in the earlier 1897 act were brought into force now that includes act of violence against uh, uh, by any persons against the healthcare service personnel serving during an epidemic which causes or may cause harassment harm injury hurt obstruction or hindrance to such healthcare services loss or damage to any property healthcare service is also recognized any public and clinical healthcare provider such as doctor nurse paramedical worker and common community health worker any other person empowered under the act to take measures to prevent the outbreak any person declared as such by the government of the government by notification and property is also defined a clinical uh, establishment has defined in clinical establishments act any facility identified for quarantine and isolation of patients during an epidemic mobile medical unit any other property in which a healthcare service personnel has direct interest in relation to the epidemic so all the healthcare services doctors nurses whoever who are working for the cause of uh, covid 19 are given protection in this 2020 amendment act and in the event there is some uh, act and action by the public against these uh, doctors that is also brought in by this amendment act where it is if any person indulge in any act of violence against a healthcare service personnel or cause any damage or loss to any property that would amount to a criminal act and they are liable to be punished and all those how the punishment should be done how the court should act and how fast the court should act everything is defined in 2020 act therefore most of the worries or healthcare service doctors nurses who had an apprehension that they would be Uh, put into some sort of trouble by act and action of the patients is covered by 2020 act and then uh, there is absolutely nothing for these uh, uh, for the healthcare service providers uh, after the coming of this uh, 2020 act uh, by the uh, government of the day now <clears throat> the act which was in 1980 1897 and 2020 covers most of the questions that is being raised vaccination in a way out of pandemic and normalization of the world in medicine there are no benefits without risk therefore this protection is also provided in 1897 way back about 100 years back so there is absolutely nothing for the doctors to worry about it uh, vaccine taken by patient patient dies now this is a repeated uh, uh, question that is being answered wherever when a, like suppose if it is a court whether it is a building being constructed or a chartered accountant doing is a particular job any profession for that matter if a person does his act in good faith they will be protected by law until unless it is substantially proved in a court of law that like suppose i am conducting i am uh, uh, taking care of a case where in a doctor uh, a small clinic a patient comes uh, he is uh, Uh, like there is an accident the patient comes to the uh, the clinic for first aid he is given first aid but there is no such provision available uh, in the clinic then he is referred to a bigger hospital the moment he is taken out of this clinic and reaches the hospital he passes away in the ambulance itself now the uh, family of those uh, 
patient who died have uh, filed a consumer protection case. They have uh, filed a petition before the medical council. They are uh, harassing the doctor and the entire unit for the last about four or five years. Medical council is being operated by a group of doctors. They are also not in a position to come and rescue the doctors at all. They are taking their own time in settling this uh, issue. And uh, the matter is now in the fifth year. Uh, taking apart uh, one uh, year lapse of uh, 2020 by virtue of uh, COVID. The entire four years, nothing has happened. And it is not the judiciary where uh, the things are happening. It is before a medical council. And medical council consists of about 21 doctors sitting in a group and deciding this issue. Therefore, whoever is taking care of things, or like uh, as I explained to you the uh, example part of it, the results are, whether it is judiciary or in medical council or there are certain other uh, uh, bodies, like consumer protection force, though there is only one judge sitting there, there are people who have influence in consumer law, who have uh, uh, expertise in consumer law. They also take their own time in settling the issues. Therefore, there is something, a big lapse within the entire process. Therefore, <laughs> the whole thing concerned is the uh, act and action of any authority, whether it is a doctor or any other profession, if he does his act in good faith, then he is protected by law and there need not be any worries as far as, far as that is concerned. A doctor organizes, uh, organizes vaccination in his hospital or clinic to help government agenda, but a patient dies. This is also against the law specifically provides. The word used is no suit or other legal proceeding shall lie against any person for anything done in good faith. Therefore, there need not be any worries. Thanks, sir. Thanks for a very comprehensive uh, uh, response. And I think you covered uh, you know, a lot of points which I was uh, bringing up. So that is uh, uh, really uh, fantastic. So, no. One other question is, co-vaccine trial patient dies. What's the solution for his family? I don't think uh, it applies to every other uh, a patient, whether he comes with a heart attack or he comes with uh, some other medical uh, uh, issues, the doctors or the government or any people or any group cannot be held responsible and the, uh, providing any solution for the family, providing financial services would not arise. Okay. On a, on a practical step, suppose, uh, you know, in a hospital, a vaccination is happening and you know, a patient dies. Uh, it may not be vaccine related. It may be some other comorbidity related. Uh, what, what are the steps, like practical steps that doctor or the hospital has to take uh, to protect themselves, sir? So, see, until unless the doctors who are uh, expert, has expertise in the field, does their act and action in good faith. And if they were to prove that uh, the patient has died, uh, not from the vaccination or uh, not from COVID-related uh, issues. There will be absolutely no issue. Now, as you know, there are about so many people have died. Like uh, there was one uh, report in the newspaper today where a, a lady uh, took the jab and uh, within two hours uh, she expired. Now, the government is trying to tell that it uh, the death was not due to vaccination. And it must be some other reasons. There is postmortem done and all those things that is being done. As far as the, the doctors or the clinic or the uh, facility is concerned, they need not be worried at all. Okay? They need not, uh, they are protected. Until unless they, instead of giving vaccination, they do something else. And uh, because of those complications, uh, the patient dies. So, <coughs> in good faith is covered by law and they are protected. So, in yes. The, in, a, in brief, okay. So that's that's great, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll just go to um, uh, other aspects uh, of uh, the legal aspects in India and uh, try to find some solution. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, the common man, you know, doesn't understand the law. So, uh, you know, because the law, like medicine, is a very complicated subject. And the words we used are very complex. And then, you know, it doesn't reach the common man. And, uh, you know... Uh, suppose, you know, one of my friends was saying, oh, let's sign a B2B contract between your center and my center. And he said, I'll send it to my lawyer. And he said, uh, you know, they're uh, writing all the clause and sub clause and everything. And then it becomes so complex. And either I understand or you understand. It was a bit like a joke, but still, you know, for a lay person, you know, it's very difficult to understand uh, what they're actually signing into. So, uh, uh, 
you know, the same problem I faced when I moved from India to England because medicine, we learn a lot of Greek and Latin and then, you know, we had to go and talk to the patients and then uh, when we talk to the patients, we use this complex language and the patients never understood. So the General Medical Council in UK said that as a doctor, you can't use, you know, complex medical terms. You know, you need to uh, desimplify, bring it to the uh, intelligence of a common man and, you know, use terms like, you know, for bacteria, use something like bugs, you know, which is people can understand rather than if you say bacteria or virus or fungi, they may not understand. So, you know, the whole, uh, you know, that is one of the basic requisites to get licensed to practice in England, you know, uh, demedicalizing medicine, you know. So, so what could be done to make uh, law uh, understood by the common man? See, the basic uh, problem again arises is uh, the formal education that the children of the day, of the day or uh, rather any doctor or uh, uh, any person in the course of their education, whether in the, in the college, uh, before joining the medical profession or uh, before uh, uh, going into a specialized uh, subject, they need to have some basic uh, information about, like uh, suppose a BE student, a, a student studying uh, engineering, will have to know what is constitution of India, what is at least the basic terms. Now, I don't know, like an expertise, a doctor uh, after PUC goes to MBBS, he doesn't have, know a word about, uh, and he may not even know the spelling of uh, constitution or he may not even know the spelling of uh, some basic. Uh, now, there is something lacking in the formal education in the high schools, in the um, uh, where uh, uh, the children try to learn there is something very uh, lacking in the entire system. This may be one of the reasons. Now, for you, you may find that the legal terms may be quite, uh, 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 what, whatever word complex. you have used. Uh, complex. Uh, like, uh, complex and it cannot be understood. Like a mere reading, a repeated reading for about uh, a few days. Like uh, for your information, there was a judge called Justice Krishnayar who was sitting in Supreme Court for about uh, 10 years. And if you were to read his judgment, you need to have a dictionary next to it. Without a dictionary, the entire judgment cannot be even understood at all. No, no, no. There are also changes. Now, there is a, a big difference is being made that the judgments in local languages should be made. Like um, most of these uh, uh, smaller uh, lower courts, what you call as uh, judges of junior division, senior division, they are asked or they are being uh, uh, given expertise to give uh, judgments in Canada. So people may try to understand uh, better what is the lucana, what is the lapses in the judgment, uh, how is affected and all those things. No doubt uh, a complex country like India where uh, people from all places uh, reside el everywhere, like expecting High Court to render judgment in local languages or Supreme Court to render in local languages is an impossible. Now, there may attempts are being made to translate it to, into all local languages. There is uh, something like the system needs, uh, I don't know, India after the constitution coming into force from 1947 or 1950, we are still too young to cope up with all these uh, problems. In fact, uh, the Supreme Court and High Courts are making efforts to translate all their judgments in every local language of the country. They are doing it. Now, there are so many complex issues uh, which, uh, I don't know, by God's grace uh, may take another uh, uh, few decades to come to that. Um, the other reasons uh, for all these things is every individual in this country are aware of their fundamental rights. They, <coughs> they talk of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of all sorts of rights. A to Z, uh, they talk of freedom of rights. But none is aware that the Constitution provides fundamental duties also. The biggest problem starts is none of us know what is fundamental duties. <coughs> Until unless uh, we are aware whatever our duties to the society, to the family, to the country, to the uh, human uh, kind, to the animals. In fact, uh, the fundamental duties which is, which is available in the Constitution also tells what is what should be our view with the nature, with the animals, with uh, everything. None of us are aware. We only talk of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and our fundamental rights for everything and anything. So this also needs a um, huge change in the mindset of the people. 
and when we talk of uh, freedom of uh, rights for every small thing we start uh, approaching the court expecting that the courts will be the mm, uh, final arbitrator for all and ever, for everything and anything now we, uh, in our country there was something called as panchayat panchayat a village there is a problem there is a dispute there is uh, some uh, uh, <coughs> difference of opinion there used to be an elderly group which used to sit and settle the matter and people had faith in the jury, that uh, panchayat system now for everything and anything we have to go to the court a judge is also a human being and uh, being uh, all uh, medical professions you know what is his capacity how much of uh, things uh, pressure or cases he can take how we could do it like uh, there are uh, innumerable uh, problems there is no um, uh, uh, supporting staff the stenographers are not well versed the uh, people supporting the system are not uh, very well versed a uh, officer who is supporting the entire system uh, to the court he himself he doesn't know what is law and what is the system they are all sslc pass puc pass etc etc so the whole system there is something burdening the whole system and uh, besides this the every one thinks that uh, they have a right in approaching the court and seeking a relief the, the high courts are uh, overburdened the supreme court is overburdened for every small issue the matter reaches the supreme court or high court this is the case now uh, like uh, it may uh, take uh, uh, hours together to explain this thing now giving two uh, small examples in a minute or two like there is something called as land acquisition case now when the new act came into force in somewhere in 2013 when uh, the earlier government formed the now thereafter from 2013 to 2019 there were some decisions by the supreme court everybody were following it in 2020 the supreme court with a bigger bench overruled the entire orders that were passed between 2014 to 2019 so the number of cases uh, again uh, coming back to the courts is in lakhs not hundreds or thousands but it is in lakhs because of one decision by a by judge bench of the supreme court likewise a daughter is whether she is entitled to her ancestral property is not it's a question which is being raised by this uh, in this country right from uh, uh, 1950 when the constitution was framed in 20 2004 the amendment to hindu succession act where in a female member is also entitled to her share etc that uh, uh, came up to high court supreme court on several occasions in 2019 there was another decision by the supreme court Uh, which overruled almost all the decisions for about uh, 2004 to 2019 so many decisions which were rendered in the higher courts were uh, overruled now again the number of cases rising because of this judgment is in lakhs the oh, burden court is now overburdened by uh, these two i am giving only an example of these two cases because the whole sea change in the policy in the decisions is uh, causing it <coughs> so therefore yeah. this yeah ma'am my next question is on the legal ethics uh, is legal ethics taught to the law graduates is it part of the law school's curriculum uh, you know i just want to know that and uh, i just really want to understand this because this been a quite a, a hot topic among uh, the doctors group that you know what is really contempt of court you know and a senior a lawyer of the supreme court like prashant bhushan getting away just with a 1 rupee fine is really shocked all the people common man you know how <coughs> does it mean that the judiciary is sought with uh, their own officers which are uh, lawyers being the officers of the court so why is the same privilege not given to the Uh, the common man you know like there's a, a meme here which says uh, supreme court gave 1 rupee fine and there's a guy who is not wearing helmet he says me who was fined 500 rupees for no helmet you know so for such a trivial thing i was uh, fined 500 rupees why should uh, somebody uh, be fined just 1 rupee for such a heinous crime like uh, contempt of a uh, uh, highest court like, well. i got it like uh, you are uh, giving the uh, simile itself is totally incorrect there is nothing called as uh, the penalty that may be imposed by the court say as far as contempt of court is concerned it is more a nature of uh, uh, contempt and uh, the courts decide whether uh, it can be punished by sending him to the judicial custody or by one rupee fine etc etc 
now there was a case where a judge of the madras high court went to calcutta he faced contempt of court case and he was in judicial custody for 2 years there was some judge called as karnam uh, uh, now there is a see, supreme court also now in spite of paying one rupee fine and all those things he is now facing the consequences now there are certain things like uh, there is a case where dr subramanya swami filed a uh, case against ram krishna hegde way back in about 19 Uh, yeah, 90s or 2000 uh, seeking for a uh, 1 rupee compensation for uh, are you uh, telling something against subramanya swami the the, the case took up uh, almost about 4 or 5 years then there was a compromise you know all those things there are things like that happening as for a person who does not wear a helmet the law provides what is the penalty that should be imposed if a person does not wear helmet what is the person uh, penalty for not wearing a seat belt everything is defined in the law as far as that is concerned it's a different uh, uh, aspect and uh, imposing penalty of 1 rupee to present question is of a different uh, um, aspect therefore uh, comparing that would be totally uh, some sort of an absurdity that may not be um, uh, like a real uh, answer to the question now uh, prashant bhushan or all those things takes a lot of uh, hearing they have wasted uh, several four uh, towers and all those. so again when it comes to ethics now the basic uh, thing is when we study in our schools right up to our college level this ethics should be in our mind in our body in our uh, thinking that is also once again being uh, not properly the education policy to the young children is a biggest uh, hurdle in the society now what is our like suppose i am reading a two wheeler i tell no no i write on the right side because uh, it is my fundamental right or uh, my, it's my way of doing it no that is how things are the ethics starts from our childhood this ethics is not being taught in the schools which is causing all the uh, problem like there is uh, the society is now totally corrupt uh, if not uh, financially mentally socially uh, the thinking itself has changed the same set of persons who live in this society reaches the medical profession reaches the, uh, the judicial profession like uh, the same uh, people reach uh, the uh, become chartered accountants engineers etc when they reach the higher accounts of the uh, their profession things like this happens Yeah. now in fact uh, if uh, since uh, two or the few of us of our uh, uh, members who are attending our uh, uh, doctors like uh, there is a usual say like there is some uh, motor vehicle acts, uh, act, um, accident cases comes up in court most of the doctors who come and give uh, evidence are the same person like uh, they don't operate on the patients they don't do anything else but they come to court every day and give uh, adios evidence in every court and uh, they take a huge fees uh, out of that compensation which is something like it also about to ethics now the since i am telling uh, as far as uh, not only with the doctors with the advocate professions they go to police station for uh, uh, taking the briefs they go to insurance companies to take the briefs they brave the officers they brave the police officers this happens when this things uh, in spite of uh, uh, having paid so much of uh, bribes uh, they feel that we, they can bribe the judiciary uh, officers also to get a better compensation to better get a, to get a better results so once this uh, bad ethics or bad system uh, like there are uh, people uh, poisonous uh, in every profession now there is a huge uh, uh, wrong things being said against uh, chartered accountants they don't do their uh, accounting properly which is causing a huge loss to the society see there are see people there are people who have come up from society so until unless we change we have our ethics we see that we play uh, properly in accordance with our action uh, our act and action should be to the benefit of the society all these uh, uh, problems persist we change we will uh, expect like uh, with uh, changes in the government with the changes in the thinking uh, we will expect that uh, india will see a better day uh, this is like uh, as far as judiciary questions that are being raised uh, that there is a delay etc 
things will change like now the people have started uh, accepting that uh, their uh, approaching courts will not give any results like that is why this lok adalat is being organized uh, settlement out of uh, arbitration is being organized so that people sit across the table try to solve the issues and we'll hopefully see that uh, things will change in the next uh, few days or few years yeah. and if uh, so uh, the final question. world and then try to close it we have a retired chief justice of india who tells that people approaching courts will not get justice this is the uh, yeah, retired chief justice of the country tell the uh, society that approaching yes. courts will not give us any results so we we'll have to take that in uh, good spirit and see that how we come out uh, uh, so you uh, place the responsibility on the individuals actually like uh, brooker washington said a lie doesn't become truth the wrong doesn't become right and evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by the majority and you mentioned about the degradation in the society which is a basic uh, sort of root cause for this and uh, you know this question uh, relates to sort of accountability in the judiciary i think there was a very famous uh, uh, vikas gube dubey case just few months ago it was a dreaded the gangster in uttar pradesh and uh, he was given a bail by uh, his lawyer and the judge in the up court and the first thing he did is he went on a rampage and he beheaded uh, several police officers including a dsp the deputy superintendent of police so now uh, you know uh, one of the thing which you commonly gets discussed in the doctor group is that oh how much compensation was awarded by the courts judiciary to different doctors for negligence like 2 crores 3 crores 10 crore i believe is the maximum fine which has been uh, given uh, uh, so far in india and uh, you know that is clearly coming under sort of medical negligence so what you know kind of punishment can be given for something like this which is a gross dereliction which led to somebody going out and uh, murdering and uh, destroying the families children and wives of uh, several people you know the two police officers again the society has such is to blame a police officer and a doctor a doctor an advocate or a chartered accountant or an engineer when they accept a responsibility they should never give way to their own thinking they should not come in uh, to their relatives to their family to their um, kith and kin this all happens now uh, since you have asked a uh, question as regard to the judiciary now most of the judges also have some sort of le- political leniency at the part of time now we are seeing a judge from the maharashtra Uh, high court uh, mumbai high court was uh, judge for almost a decade now the moment he came out of the judiciary uh, he joined a particular political party and uh, since uh, his uh, whatever act and action during his judiciary days were uh, to be questioned now vikas dube was uh, enlarged on bail uh, taking into consideration the supreme court judgment where they tell that uh, jail is not the final it is always bail uh, imposing conditions or uh, giving some uh, the directions that he should act in such a such a way and all those there are people like vikas who very uh, in the therefore it needs some correction and uh, we expect that uh, society the teachers the professors uh, whether uh, uh, they teach the young uh, the best will all uh, come to a uh, conclusion in the days to come so this is the report which came recently around 4 5 months ago in the times of india saying that uh, maharashtra has the best uh, judiciary uh system in the in the country and uh, tamil nadu uh, as per the ranking came second uh, to justice delivery and uh, we had a you know very very uh, bizarre judgment which came from uh, the high court of uh, maharashtra particularly i think the nagpur bench uh, where a female judge you know i think her name was pushpa gandewal and uh, she in fact said that uh, only if there is skin to skin contact Uh, then there is molestation of women and if it is not there is no molestation and she kept uh, did two more uh, judgments there she said can't rape minor without a scuffle and uh, the unzipping a pant is not a, a molestation you know in a pasco act it has really shocked the conscience of the country uh, how could we prevent such people from taking over into power and uh, giving these kinds of uh, very strange judgments see some of the set judgment uh, 
is being interpreted uh, wrongly and coming into this now a particular judge understands the judge and interprets the particular uh, uh, provision uh, uh, from uh, her way of understanding this now if it had been a, a male judge it would have been much more uh, uh, controversial than because it is being a uh, lady judge now the there is a law the law provides there should be how a rape is to be uh, defined how it should be done etc etc and there is uh, changes because supreme court interprets in its own way the supreme court uh, uh, different judgment gives uh, different uh, uh, interpretations this lady must have uh, uh, a particular decision might have come to her hands and given it now see like uh, i said in my first few words a production is given to a judge if this particular judge uh, uh, justice uh, pushpa garedewala has given the judgment with some uh, malafide intention or with some uh, illegal intentions to help the uh, uh, accused this would have been there now an interpretation has come to her mind like a doctor gives a, a prescription and the other doctor may tell no the prescription given is wrong like uh, it all happens in every profession now this lady has given a judgment or uh, a uh, interpretation of her own that is uh, stated by the high court which decides the public now coming up against her as if she has done a greatest uh, mistake in the entire judiciary it looks absurd like uh, see there are hundred and lakhs of judgments which goes to high court and supreme court everything is reversed now there is a case when uh, a rape accused is uh, convicted the high court tells no there is no rape and it uh, acquits him therefore can we tell that the high court is wrong and when it comes to supreme court supreme court is wrong no 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 the exp- the words used are uh, the judgment may give some wrong meaning to the society as such but whatever she has done is by discharging her duty as a judge until unless there is a manifest the manifest intention as i told you as far as doctor is concerned protection is given likewise she is also protected until unless somebody shows that to help the accused she has given this uh, decision yeah this is uh, to one of the close friends who is a doctor as well and uh, he had a site which was encroached and he met one of the senior high court lawyers just like yourself and uh, you know that lawyer you know the first remark that he made like the judge what you mentioned uh, is that indian judiciary is broken and you know he himself was fighting uh, for his own father's land for the last 25 years and still that uh, case was going on it was not resolved in the high court and he said uh, to this doctor that you know i'll introduce you to a rowdy and uh, the rowdy sort of demanded that 2 lakhs he said you give me 2 lakhs i will uh, sort of demolish the illegal structure and build a compound and uh, you know it's uh, but being a doctor you know we, we we don't want to break the law and you know uh, so he went on uh, uh, the route of law okay. and hey, he down the what is the question he's yeah so he has paid the same amount 2 lakhs but still uh, justice is still pending so how do we address this uh, issue of huge delay in the justice system that's it the problem is there is too much of appeals too much of uh, Uh, rights being asserted by every individual now you go to a court and there is an always an appeal uh, available to you it has to go to the higher court uh, the higher court will decide something and it comes back to the court or the high court uh, gives a different reasonings and uh, set aside now all these things are uh, since it is all uh, a question of property and all those things it may take no no <coughs> as i am repeatedly telling you the entire system is uh, perverse with uh, you know, corruption with mental uh, corruption with uh, economic corruption the uh, attitude of the indian society as such is that they can uh, get anything done by paying money or delaying it now a uh, best example is like i want my property to be protected by a court of law the opposite party should also come to the uh, to the assistance of the court and see that the matter is settled the other party is not at all interested he take his own time to see that the uh, matter uh, uh, gets delayed so therefore until the entire system or the whole uh, uh, things change like we see in uh, uk or america a case may take up only one day a criminal case will take only maximum is one week not beyond our case takes a decade 
so the entire uh, thinking the judiciary we follow uh, england uh, uh, laws uh, very strictly where england or uk is not uh, following their own uh, decision we are following it by uh, in between lines and every full stop every comma like uh, for your information so many number of judgments to use a comma how to use the uh, semicolon in a law so this is causing the entire uh, problem so as i told you repeatedly telling you it may take some time things may change for a better now in spite of telling all these things um, uh, i am not that i am supporting the judiciary as a you uh, like i had my own uh, Uh, views like I told, we'll close the courts for about ten uh, years. I say that the matter is settled between some sort of other arbitration process. Things may the whole uh, process may change. There is also one more one of my views when uh, when I was uh, uh, addressing a group of advocates. So things happens like uh, we are in a society where uh, the whole uh, thing is uh, taking sea change every day, every minute, every second. So we'll always. Uh, Uh, and i am a person with the greatest of hopes that things would change in the next uh, few years or uh, say within the next decade yeah, yeah that's great sir i think we should change otherwise uh, you know why should we be bothered you know if we don't raise voice then this kind of a criminal kaki kadi nexus can threaten the national security as nia is unraveling in maharashtra madam said that she will not deal with maharashtra or with bangalore but you know this is where things are happening so uh, you know we need to draw a line between this uh, outer enemies of india like isa and the internal terrorists like, like uh, the present situation in maharashtra where a police officer is himself uh, a party to the political party uh, all those things uh, Uh, putting a car in front of somebody is so sad. All those things we are saying uh, day in and day out for the last one week. So the uh, uh, police are uh, corrupt. The politicians are corrupt. The advocates are uh, corrupt. The entire professionals are corrupt. Where do we go? Where do we end up? So the entire police system has gone. There is no hope <laughs> in the judiciary as such. and every decision that is rendered by the supreme court uh, or the high court the public will tell no 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 they have taken some money that's the reason they have given such a judgment this is being done if even to the extent of uh, ram uh, ram janmabhoomi issue they tell uh, the judges are prime so we don't know where do we end up uh, yeah and uh, you know i just wonder with the three crores of cases which is pending in the country and uh, do we as indians and even the judiciary do we deserve the three tier judicial system i mean say justice delayed they say is justice denied are we really giving justice to our citizenry and if we are, like you said you know why don't we shut it up for 10 years and see what happens really maybe arbitration will occur and the cases will get solved soon and uh, what can be done to really you know uh, you know cut this pendency or shape the future judiciary and if there is a bizarre case uh, i think yesterday day for the uh, delhi high court stayed in order of the supreme court i mean say how bizarre it can get so like uh, there is some uh, statistics available as far as uh, how many cases and what type of cases are uh, pending in the courts out of this 3 crores pending uh, to the uh, statistical uh, uh, reasons that are given is 2 crore cases are between family members brother sisters or father and son husband and wife uh, children filing a case for partition or uh, uh, sisters filing a case of partition is 2 crore case out of 3 crores 2 crore cases are in within the family now as i told you the society is corrupt the mentality of the people have uh, is corrupted uh, totally now until unless there is a system or of give and take they like, correct right, a sister uh, brother will tell all right uh, i'll give a part of uh, it to the sister or sister will tell uh, i'll give a part of it i don't uh, claim a small logistic if not for the entire will uh, pushing their entire rights if there is some give and take uh, uh, thinking in the society as such this uh, three crore cases will come down to one crore in a matter of days now the entire uh, system is everybody is asserting right a daughter who is married staying in the husband's house for almost two decades 
comes back to the court and claims that her father had a property or grandfather had a property, she wants a right. That will take 10 years. Now, even assuming the brother or uh, father or uncle, whatever it is, they give a few uh, hundred or thousand or lakhs or whatever it is, and she accepts it with a good relationship in future and all those things, entire judiciary will But the problem is, as I told you, the mental So, uh, yeah, the next yeah, question was, uh, yeah, yeah. Madam, you want to ask questions? Yeah, yeah, please, ma'am. Sir, uh, in the, uh, this is the uh, lab uh, point of view. Sometimes what happens, uh, by mistake, we release a wrong report to the patient. And uh, recently it happened with COVID. We have given by mistake a patient uh, who was negative, positive report. And the patient is planning, uh, he was, he's actually a lawyer. So he's threatening us that he will sue us and uh, he will defame us on the social media and whatnot. So uh, what do you think will happen if he actually goes to court, sir? But as I told you right from uh, point number one, now you need not have to worry because you are protected. Okay. Now these things happen. Now whether it is an Apollo hospital in Bangalore or Apollo... Uh, hospital in New Delhi, this problem still continues with the same thing. They try to blackmail us. They try to you know, go to social media. They try to give us uh, or defame us personally, not only hospital. They take your name by name and try to tell that you are uh, you know, creating problem or uh, because of you, they have lost the family member, etc., etc., and uh, create a wrong impression in the whole society and your uh, profession may be affected and all those things. But you need not be worried at any cost, provided you have done your best or you have given <coughs> your act and action was in good faith. You need not worry. Now, there is a Supreme Court judgment of 2020 which tells even if a doctor has uh, given her best, even to the extent of about 70%, uh, that uh, amounts that uh, good faith and she should not be punished. Consumer Protection Force, uh, sorry, Consumer Protection Law and uh, uh, Medical Council has also has accepted the uh, rulings of Supreme Court. So, as a doctor, you need not worry on that count at all. Okay, thank you. Sir. So, thank my you. sort of uh, concluding uh, question uh, is about how to make our judiciary more accountable. I think some steps, uh, some points we discussed already, uh, but some points which came to my mind was uh, that you know yesterday, you know, uh, Supreme Court itself has taken some corrective steps that you know the Supreme Court judges should have gender sensitivity. And you know, should not ask uh, rapists to uh, marry the victim. You know, that's not a solution. You know, the victim has come for a, a punishment for the rapist. You know, the saying that uh, tie a rocky or something. That's not a solution. There is no role for uh, like a paternalistic attitude towards victims. So I think the judiciary itself is doing some correction. So maybe I feel that there may be a role of artificial intelligence or robotic judges who can be given CRPC and uh, IPC coded, and then they decide. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, impartially what needs to be done and they can work 24 7 365 days uh, uh, 365 days a year so there's no holidays so that can cut pendency and maybe like uh, you know, Indra Jai Singh was Supreme Court uh, lawyer says uh, we have to record all the court cases so that if somebody is watching people are careful and you know less likely to commit mistakes than somebody is not watching you know and uh, you know that those might sort of help but I would like to ask you, sir, you've been quite candid, you know, what are your uh, top uh, tips for making uh, our judiciary accountable? Sir, uh, before uh, coming to your uh, uh, artificial intelligence question or uh, uh, the recording of uh, cases and all those things, like the, the uh, clapping is by something, uh, there's a common uh, sentence where they tell clapping should be by two hands, uh, not by one the thing. Now, as a professional, as I am a professional, I should know how to operate a computer. I should know how to, uh, at least if not being an expertise in the computerization and the related issues, I should know the basics of it. Now, here is the case, 70% of the professional uh, advocates, they don't know how to operate a, a computer. Now, the younger generation who are coming up with the uh, new colleges, everything is right. So, I told you, it may take some more years to do it. The judges should also know uh, that there is something called as artificial intelligence. How to apply that in their case, how to use those uh, things should be also uh, taken into consideration. Now, we have a judiciary where 
most of the judges are 50 plus so they are now understanding what is artificial intelligence how to use a particular uh, judgment uh, uh, by robotic uh, method and apply into our case it's all uh, a greatest of great imagination so like as i told you it may take another uh, generation or say about another 10 years where all these things may happen now for your information there is something called as uh, the uh, a basic what we have to file to the court uh, the advocates are not in a position to do it on their own they are depending on others so this dependency has to come down rapidly and then it will happen and uh, like uh, recording of uh, cases these things are happening for the last one decade. They are trying to attempt to uh, uh, do everything to see how an uh, advocate argues the matter and all those things. If not for COVID-19 uh, in uh, 2020, there would have been much more uh, uh, <clears throat> some uh, development in that uh, recording of uh, all court cases or rather um, like in uh, Lok Sabha or uh, Rajya Sabha, that would have been also. Now, coming to the the other part of it uh, is like uh, they make the same allegations against every other profession. They tell no, the doctor should also uh, come up with uh, uh, recording of all operations. Uh, they like this blame game. I'm not uh, trying to tell uh, against this profession or that profession. Everything like a chartered accountant going and arguing a matter before an income tax authority. Like uh, we tell that no, there is only a question of. Uh, they discuss what is the bribe to be paid or how the manipulation should be made, and etc. Like there also, there should be some recording as to how a uh, chartered accountant faces a, a income tax or uh, some uh, sales tax officer. All those things are there. <coughs> so if we start blaming, everything is um, uh, looks uh, dubious and uh, uh, it is not very very as if it is uh, clean. Uh, so my only uh, what I try to say before this uh, uh, group of uh, doctors and all those things are uh, it, uh, like if this way to reach the public at large, until unless our attitude changes to the society, to the human beings, to the family, uh, to the uh, nation uh, at uh, large, these uh, things continue to happen. The uh, last sentence is this uh, family court where husband and wife who take a pledge and vow that they should live together for the uh, entire life. The number of cases where you tell three crores, uh, it is running to almost about 50 lakh cases in family court uh, where husband and wife, uh, children, they are fighting. So, until unless we have this uh, uh, thinking or uh, changing our attitude, this will continue for uh, days to come. Will, uh, with a hope that uh, things would be better in the next few days. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for a very uh, lucid and a very clear presentation of uh, what was truly uh, judiciary in the hot seat. Uh, as you said, uh, maybe prevention is better than cure. Maybe we should have more arbitration courts than the real courts. We should shut the courts for 10 years and see what really happens. You know, I think you know that is a very positive way of uh, going about it. And uh, uh, Dr. Vani, it's an amazing presentation from you and uh, hope uh, more of us can use the COVID protect to really know what's happening with us rather than uh, blindly following medicine uh, to have evidence-based backup to the medicine that we practice. So I really thank both of you for your time and uh, uh, least but not the last but not the least I would like to thank Dr. Ashok Sham for bringing this uh, program via Ortho TV throughout India. So it's an amazing platform. So thank you very much. And uh, you know, uh, if you have uh, any questions, Dr. Rani, if you got any questions? Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity given to me to express uh, what I did, what was in my mind. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We will end the show now. Thanks, Dr. Ashok. Thank you so much.